Hello and welcome to chapter 10 in Computers and Healthcare. We are going to talk about consumer informatics. This is a fairly short chapter and this is actually the first time I've included it in this course, um, but some of the domains, uh, one of the domains in the RHIT exam included some information about consumer informatics, so I wanted to be sure to cover that this year um, just so that everybody is familiar with what consumer informatics are. Um, this chapter, again, is very short. We're going to talk about patient portal and the personal health record. So again, it's going to be a review um, of some of the information that you've had in other courses and some of the information you'll see again in, in, in more courses as you progress through the program. But we're starting in the textbook on page 169. And so we know that our consumers in healthcare are our patients. Um, and in certain settings, they may be called clients or residents, but they are the recipient of healthcare services. And so, therefore, consumer informatics is known as the field devoted to informatics from multiple consumer or patient views. Because of this day, this day and time, there's so many avenues um, uh, for technology and for patients to be um, more involved in their health care. Um, if you don't have a smartphone, then you probably have an iPad. And if you don't have an iPad, then you probably have a computer. And even if you don't have one yourself, you have access to one somewhere, whether it's a friend or a family member or you go into a public library. There's access um, basically anywhere these days. So let's first talk about health literacy. Now, um, health literacy is the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process, and understand basic health information and services needed to make appropriate health decisions. Now, first of all, let's just talk about the word literacy. We know that literacy means being able to read, basically. So when we get into health literacy specifically, we're talking about the patient actually being able to speak to that physician and listen to what that physician has to say and actually understand what they're hearing, okay? So if you've ever been to a physician before that just spoke 10 levels above your head, you know, that you may not have had a health literacy moment there but what we're talking about is the fact that patients can obtain process and understand basic health information and services needed to make appropriate health care decisions now it says um, 90 million adult Americans have limited health literacy even patients with advanced education frequently do not understand their health information and the healthcare delivery system, which are complex even for health professionals. The Department of Health and Human Services is working to solve this problem. Now, the National Action Plan to Improve Health Literacy has established seven goals to improve health literacy. So first of all, access. They want to provide access to health and safety information. Then they want to improve health information and communication. So they want to create change in the healthcare system that would improve health information and communication of that information. The next one I think is absolutely important, but they want to incorporate health information into schools. The next, support adult education efforts. Next, conduct research on health literacy, and then use evidence-based health literacy practices. Now, health literacy is not necessarily about the patient's reading ability or their education level, but about the understanding of items and concepts related to their health care. So I can have the, an excellent, you know, um, reading level and I could have a master's or a doctorate in literature but that doesn't mean I understand healthcare jargon and we're gonna get to the word jargon over on the next page now health literacy does include the ability to understand prescription medications discharge instructions 
consent forms, appointment scheduling, requests for information, and the ability to negotiate complex healthcare organizations that offer a variety of services in multiple locations. Anything that affects the patient's ability to make decisions related to their health care, including understanding insurance coverage and billing, or their rights as a patient is related to health literacy. So there's a number of factors that contribute to a person's health literacy. So first of all, communication skills. That's number one. Next, what is your knowledge of health care? You know, do you have any knowledge of healthcare at all? Those people would be most likely to have the least amount of health literacy. Now, prior to going through this program, you may not have had the knowledge that you've had, but going through medical terminology and pathophysiology and pharmacology, and when you get to coding, you're going to have so much more understanding of healthcare and then other courses of course you're going to understand the healthcare process all right the next one demands on the healthcare um sorry uh, skip one culture-based experiences with or knowledge of healthcare so their culture and then the demands on the healthcare facility we have other um factors so if they're older than 65 their literacy may not be quite as great um, another factor, non-white ethnicity, recent immigration, poverty level or below, and then people that have English or, or speak English as a second language. Those are also factors that contribute to um, a little bit of lesser um, health literacy. Now, patients for whom English is a second language may struggle with everyday communications, much less the complex language of medicine. However, communication goes far beyond the words or language used by the patient and the physician, extending to the ability of the patient to understand implications beyond the fundamental meaning. This can be connected to culture, which is what members of the group have, common, have in common, including their ideas and values. Now, health literacy is important for a number of reasons. So, some of these reasons include the ability to find uh, the way through a healthcare delivery system, which we do not have this on the slide, so um, don't look for it there. Knowing the inf knowing what information to share with a healthcare provider, the ability to care for yourself, and the ability to understand the risk. So that's why health literacy is so important. Now, patients get their medical knowledge from many different sources. So, first of all, magazine and other news sources. They may get information from commercials or other marketing campaigns that they see on TV. Uh, they may get their information from families or friends. Um, you may have a nurse in your family or a doctor in your family or a physical therapist in your family, and they're the ones that you go to for information. You can also get information on websites. And then again, we already talked about commercials. All right, moving over to page 171. Now, we've all had that experience to where we go and we talk to a physician about something and <clears throat> they just start talking and they are talking completely above our heads. You know, we don't know what they're talking about. That, that is called jargon. So it's a special terminology used by a specific group. So physicians use jargon, they use medical jargon. Uh, computer programmers, they have their own languages and they speak in code sometimes. Or, you know, if you were working in the um, flight industry, there's jargon for pilots. So jargon just means it's a specialized terminology used by a specific group. So everyone can have it, but it's special to whatever they're doing. Now, Medical terminology is sometimes called the language of medicine. So that's one of the reasons that we include medical terminology in this program is just so that you have that understanding, that base understanding of different diseases, of um, those different combining forms and things like that. Just it kind of paved the way through the whole HIT program. Now, dropping back down in the jargon paragraph, it says even health information management has jargon. So we're going to talk about MSDRGs later on in coding and in reimbursement with Ms. Vaughn. 
We've talked about health information exchange. We've talked about notice of privacy practices. And so there are a lot of different terms that are specific to HIM or HIT. And so we really do have our own jargon. Now, um, another thing I wanna talk about, uh, it, it uses an example in here about um, using some everyday terms that, that we think about um, tubes tied, getting your tubes tied. Well, let's say a patient agrees to have her tubes tied, but if she doesn't really understand that that means she can't have any more babies, then, then we have issues here. So using terms that everyone can understand and making sure that they understand those terms is very important especially in the medical community because, you know, maybe they didn't understand what tubes tied meant and now they're sterile <clears throat> and they wanted to have more children. Now, dropping down um, into that next paragraph under the bullet points, when confused, patients may take an overdose or an underdose of medication because they do not understand the instructions on the bottle or what the physician said. So again, it's not just understanding terms, but it's understanding the concept of when do I take my prescriptions? How often do I take it? Do I take it with food? What's the dosing again? How often, you know, if I'm on a steroid pack and you know, we've all taken those steroid packs, take two at breakfast and one after lunch and two before bed and you know, there's so much that goes into healthcare that we sometimes we just become immune to it, especially if we work in healthcare. Now, at the bottom of that page, or not quite at the bottom, it starts talking about tools that you can use as literacy tools. So, pictures or strategies such as Teach Back and Ask Me Three. So, these are available to healthcare providers to help ensure that understanding of their patients. Now, there's the old adage that says, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, pictures, graphs, and other visual aids can present health information in a way that's easy to understand. These pictures should not be the only method of communication, but more used as reinforcement. Now, the teach back communication strategy involves using simple language to explain the patient's condition, and then asking the patient to repeat the information in their own words. This enables the healthcare provider to ensure that the patient understands their condition, their plan of care, and the directions that they received. Then we have the Ask Me Three initiative. Now this method promotes the patients to help themselves get information that they need. So they need to ask three questions. What is my problem? What should I do? And why do I need to do this? So asking these three questions, it brings the patient into their own healthcare process so that they, they can help improve that communication process themselves. Okay, all right, let's move on to the consumer health applications. So this is part that probably will be somewhat of um, a refresher, maybe from health records but computer health applications are healthcare-based applications designed for use by the patient or provider on smartphones, tablets, and other computers. These help to access information, to encourage a healthy lifestyle, they can track calories um, and other information, steps, uh, you can use weight trackers, they manage their conditions and they can access personal health records, so their PHRs. Now, the providers use it to access health information, communicate with their patients, monitor their patients, and then they can use it to provide tele uh, telehealth or telemedicine. Now, let's get into telehealth. This should be somewhat of a review or a little bit of a review um, from alternate care because we did have a little section there on telehealth. So we know this is defined as the use of electronic information and telecommunication technologies to support and promote long distance clinical health care, patient and professional health related education, 
public health, and health administration. It's used in dentistry, counseling, both physical and occupational therapy, disease management, patient information, and more. Telehealth technologies include video conferencing, the internet, store and forward imaging, streaming media, and terrestrial and wireless communications. Now, telehealth technology can be used for electronic visits or e-visits, which can take the form of real-time videos or use a patient portal whereby patient logs into an information system and then asks the physician questions. So you've got different methods there. <clears throat> now, some of the benefits for telehealth. Patients who live in rural areas can reduce or eliminate trips to the city to see specialists. So we still have so many areas in America that are, you know, you may be 50 miles away from your nearest healthcare provider. And so telehealth kind of takes some of that burden off of that patient of having to get out and travel to see their provider. So patients can also be monitored while going about their day-to-day -day business. Hospitalizations may be reduced as health issues may be identified early. The amount of time out of work is less as travel time is reduced since the monitoring is done remotely. And patients can submit blood sugar, blood pressure, and pulse results to their healthcare professional. Now, in addition to being more convenient for your patients, it's also led to better outcomes, reduced cost of care, and higher patient satisfaction. It says, as a result, the number of patients using telehealth is rapidly increasing. Estimates show approximately 250,000 patients used telehealth in 2013. So we're talking seven years ago. I mean, imagine how much larger that number is today. It's expected to increase to 3.2 million patients by 2018. So I'm sure it's probably even higher than that, of course, for 2020. All right, so let's go to disadvantages. We have some disadvantages of telehealth. Well, first of all, there's lack of provider funds because historically telehealth has not been, um, trying to think of the way to word this, it's not been a very lucrative money-making business for providers. So you have the lack of funds to start the telehealth program and then you may only get paid $20 for that e-visit. Now that physician may have spent 15, 20 minutes with the patient, but you know, if you went to a clinic and paid an office visit, your co pays $20 uh, or $30, depending on who you see and what your insurance is like. And that, that may be all they get for that entire visit. So they could have had services, they could have had um, some lab work done. In the instances where they can go to a local clinic and have a nurse or a phlebotomist draw blood, and they still only get $20 for that reimbursement. Um, and then again, that, that's the last one too, so reimbursement. So money is a factor all the way around, getting the program started and then just keeping it funded. And then of course there's no face-to-face -face interaction. Sometimes patients um, don't get that warm and fuzzy feeling when they don't see the doctor sitting right beside them um, in a room. And then you have issues with patients' technology. So not everybody has high-speed internet, um, <clears throat> their internet connection just may not may be poor and so it, it's harder for them to actually connect um, with those physicians. All right, so let's talk about some consumer informatics applications here. <clears throat> so one of the benefits of consumer informatics is that these technologies encourage consumer engagement. And that's the whole purpose of, you know, different things like portals, and we're going to talk about portals and personal health records, is getting that patient active and engaged with their own care. So consumer engagement is a diverse set of activities that can include interacting with healthcare providers, seeking health information, maintaining a personal health record, and playing an active role in making decisions in regard to personal health care. Research shows that for consumer informatics to have a positive impact on patients' health, three factors are key. Individual tailoring, 
of the interaction based on the characteristics of the patient, personalization, which is customizing the program specifically for the patient, and behavior feedback, which provides messages to the patient about how well he is doing and where he is in the program. Now, in order to encourage patient engagement, the Blue Button Campaign was established by the Office of National Coordinator for Health IT, so the ONC, and it was a consumer-motivated method to improve healthcare by having the patient or caregiver actively involved in decisions and planning by having direct access to personal health information. Now, <clears throat> the again, the benefits of consumer engagement include a reduced cost, increased communication between physicians and patients through the use of technology, improved patient satisfaction, and population health. And then now when we get into population health, we're talking about capture and reporting of healthcare data that are used for public health purposes. So we're really talking about just ensuring that the patients that we treat within our facility or within our service area, um, they get their diabetes screenings, or if they're a female patient, then they have a, a mammogram, or if we're you know hitting that 50 year old mark, I'm not sure if 50 is the actual number. It may, I, I'm not sure if they changed it, but but whatever age you're supposed to get that first colonoscopy. You know, ensuring that the population that you serve is as healthy as they can possibly be. So that's really what population health is kind of doing. Um, it also allows the healthcare provider to report infectious disease, immunizations, cancer, and other reportable conditions to public health officials. Population health benefits through the information collected by healthcare providers and health departments that can be used to identify trends and improve the quality of care. So um, if you look at the number of colonoscopies or the number of breast cancers that are reported and you go back and you look at the number of mammograms um, done preventatively, um, you can kind of start looking at those trends. <coughs> now the three key consumer informatics applications are patient portals, the PHR, and social media. So let's talk about those on the next page. All right, so moving over to 174. Talking about our patient portals first. Now, <clears throat> patient portal, you've heard this term before, but this is an information system established and maintained by the healthcare facility. So this is how you can connect to their, their system and you can obtain health information, you can schedule or register for an appointment, um, you can send in a secure email to your provider if you needed to ask just a just needed an answer of one question. There's access forms. You can update your demographics. Let's say you move and you need to put a new um, physical address there. And you can also request um, prescription refills here. So when you access your health information through the portal, you know, you can see your lab results, you can see any summaries of hospitalizations if you've been in the hospital recently. You can see what your current medications are. And sometimes you can see your um, x-rays, just depends on how sophisticated the patient portal is. But the benefit of using a portal is that it, it strengthens the communications between the healthcare provider and the patient. It also provides patients with their healthcare information, and it can provide patients with resources between visits. It also encourages patient engagement. So if a patient is engaged in their healthcare, then they're more likely to follow up with their physician or go to their physician when they're having issues. And then last, it reduces the amount of time that the healthcare staff spend answering the phone, processing requests for information and related activities. So if patients, even 5% of patients go in and schedule an appointment through the portal, that's 5% less phone calls they receive to get that appointment scheduled. Or patients aren't necessarily having a call and saying, hey, I need my Coumadin refilled. They can go into the portal and they can ask for that prescription refill. Now, 
a thing about the portal is that there's very little training given to patients, okay? A lot of times what I've seen personally is that it falls through the cracks as to whose responsibility it is to actually give that patient some training on how to access the patient portal. Now, on the outpatient side, you go to a clinic and you see your provider in the clinic and sometimes they'll send you an email and say, hey, if you wanna click and select your, uh, go into your portal account, here's your access code, blah, blah, blah. I, I use my, part, my portal for my outpatient side, I do. Um, I go in and I keep up with blood pressures or I look at different diagnoses. If I've been having a lot of ear infections or a lot of sinus infections, I go back to my doctor and say, hey, you saw me two months ago and six months ago for the same issue. What, what can we do? So it kind of keeps you engaged, of course. But getting there and understanding how to use the system, that's the hard part. So many of the patients are even unable to understand the information because again, we go back to health literacy issues. Now, when the healthcare provider can supply training for the patients that addresses how, long, how to log in and navigate the site, privacy concerns and health literacy, then it makes things just a whole lot better for both the provider and the patient. Now, we have two types of patient portals. And again, this is a, re a review and um, you will also have this information next semester in electronic health records. But we have our standalone portals, <clears throat> and then we have system integrated portals. Now, standalone portals do not have all the same features that your integrated portals, and they're usually used by your smaller systems. <clears throat> uh, some of the trends in patient portals, we're in that last paragraph in that section, includes personalization, mobile devices, wearable technology, and communication. So personalization allows the healthcare provider to dispense educational material and other resources specific to the patient's condition. Mobile devices are used by the patient to enter data, such as blood sugar levels, into the portal for review by the physician, and then data captured by wearable technology, such as fitness trackers and other monitoring devices can be uploaded and reviewed by the physician as well. Patient portal supports two-way communication, which allows the patient to work with physicians between patient visits, request appointments, and then receive reminders. These reminders can be for appointments, need for follow-up, and more. All right, now we're moving to our personal health record. So our personal health record, we've talked about this in health records, can be an electronic or a paper health record that's maintained and updated by the patient themselves, okay? So if I go to the hospital and I ask for a copy of an ER visit, let's say I was in the ER two days ago, and I go get a copy of my ER visit and I go home and I punch my three ring binder holes in it and I stick it in a binder and I keep that, and every time I go to the doctor and every time I go to the hospital, I get copies of my records and I maintain those myself. That's my personal health record. Okay. Now, the PHR contains health information that comes from both the physician and the patient, but the PHR is again controlled by the patient. It says it's estimated that 75% of adults will be using PHRs by 2020. So think about that. Do you have a PHR? Now, it's important because it links health information from all of the patient's care providers into a central location. So if you're a sicker individual and you have to go to a gastroenterologist and you have to see a urologist and you have um, You've had a history of cancer and you you know maybe you see your regular physician pretty often or you're in maintenance from a cancer and you see an oncologist well you see a lot of different health providers and so you have different visits different doctor types and so it basically just it's it's a composition of all of those different types of visits rolled into one now several items that you should include 
into your PHR are going to be your personal identification. So, of course, your date of birth, your name, your emergency contacts, names, addresses, and phone numbers of your physicians, dentist, and any specialist that you see, your health insurance information, if you have a living will or an advanced directive, your organ donor authorization, a list and dates of significant illnesses and surgical procedures, current meds and the dosages, allergies, sensitivities to drugs or other materials. So if you have a latex allergy, you want to put that in there. Or a penicillin allergy, you want to put that in there. Important events, dates, or hereditary conditions in your family. Results from recent physical exams. And then a whole much more. So you can see the rest of those bulleted out on page 175. Now, much of the information in the PHR is same as in the patient portal. Now, the distinction between the two, again, is that the personal health record, the PHR, is created and controlled by the patient, but the portal is created and controlled by the healthcare facility. So, PHR, patient, portal, provider. Now, there's currently four common types or formats of personal health records. So number one is paper. Two, using your own personal computer. Three, the internet. And four, on your portable device, whether it's an iPad or some kind of smartphone. Now obtaining copies of health records and organizing them into a folder or a three ring binder is one way to start your PHR. However, because there's only one source, accessibility is limited. So again, if you have just that binder, you have to physically have that binder in your possession at all times for it to be effective. But if I carried around my smartphone, which I do, and I had some kind of app where I contained my information, then I can access that anytime I have my phone in my hand. Now, it says uh, you could also keep it on a USB drive, but again, the physical nature of the USB formats the limit, uh, still limits the accessibility. So, really and truly, you're looking for something more internet-based or cloud-based to where you could get into it from anywhere. So, using a website or um, some kind of system online allows you to log into that no matter where you are. Now, a personal computer-based product uses the patient's computer for storage of information that can be printed or copied to a portable device to take to the healthcare provider. The internet, again, provides information at any time from anywhere. And then um, your portable devices can kind of do the same thing. Now, Talking about internet-based, we have two types. We have a tethered and we have an untethered. So tethered PHRs are connected to an electronic health record and they allow patients to access information contained within a healthcare organization's electronic health record. But your untethered, they're not connected to an EHR, okay? Now, one benefit of a tethered is that patients can identify any errors and therefore request a correction to the EHR. Now, um, it also allows patients to share information from their healthcare providers, their exercise regimen, medications, dietary supplements, and any other information that they want their healthcare provider to know. So the patient controls who has access to the information and what information it contains. But there are some challenges to the PHR and you can see that over in figure 10.1 on page 176. So you have some challenges there. All right, let's talk about our last, um, last thing here, social media. Now, social media, we all know, are online tools that allow people to communicate. Healthcare facilities use social media to advertise their services, promote wellness, 
provide health education, provide support forums, and provide other communications to their patients and the general public. The benefits of using social media in healthcare include building a sense of community for patients with chronic illnesses, patients are better informed and they can track their health, patients can search for clinical trials that they might qualify for, and building awareness of conditions. Other social media uses include online communities, exchange of information between healthcare providers and communication between patients and healthcare providers via mobile devices. Patient information cannot be exchanged via social media due to privacy laws, but healthcare facilities may use social media to share emergency room wait times, list their new services, gain information about patient satisfaction, and more. However, healthcare facilities must be careful when using social media because patient privacy can be compromised. Statements can be misinterpreted, and unhappy patients can use it as a sounding board. So the healthcare policies and procedures should address who can access social media websites from within the healthcare facility. And I'll tell you, um, a long time ago, you could get to Facebook at North Mississippi Medical Center. You could actually get to the website, and now they have it blocked. You type in facebook.com, and it pops up a message that you are blocked. So they actually do not allow anyone with internet access at the hospital to get on Facebook. You also need to address improper usage of social media, the penalties for improper use of social media, the responsibilities of employees to report that improper use, and to ensure that employees know that statements on their personal social media accounts can impact the healthcare facility. Patients can use social media to text, blog, and post status updates to share information about their condition with their family and friends, access support groups for their particular disease, and raise money for medical research. So again, this was a short chapter, not a lot of information here um, that, that's difficult to comprehend. So again, go back through each one of these little sections. So talk about, go back and study health literacy, um, issues with, um, patients being literate, so um, communication skills, level of education of healthcare, cultural-based experiences, demands on the healthcare facility, things like that. Um, and then go through your consumer applications. So again, we're talking about um, telehealth there, telemedicine, and then our consumer informatics in, uh, applications. So again, we're talking about our patient portals, our personal health records, and social media. So again, this is a super short chapter. Just read through there, make sure you understand each of the key terms and the different concepts. And happy reading and happy.